Hi. In this video, I'd like to continue our discussion of, of generalized linear models and specifically extend our previous discussion of uh, logistic regression models, which are, are binomial models where there's two cases, a true or a false, yes or a no, uh, to now a multinomial regression model where we consider more than two possible outcomes. So here we're generally dealing with categorical variables where we're trying to predict the categorical y as a function of some continuous x. Um, and so we're trying to model the probability of falling within each of multiple groups. Um, and those categories might be ordered uh, or they might be unordered. So they may be ordinal or nominal data. Uh, a common example of a multinomial regression model might be a classification model, such as a remote sensing model to classify um, you know, remotely sensed imagery into, you know, different land cover classes uh, or, or something like that. Uh, the multivariate model really, uh, the multinomial model is really extending uh, the logistic regress regression into the multivariate case where you have multiple categories. Uh, and specifically, we're going to focus on one variant of, of multinomial regression uh, called the cumulative logit model. So we're going to write down um, a series of logistic regressions to describe these different cases. Uh, in the end, we're going to, if we have k different classes we're trying to classify uh, outcomes into, uh, we're going to end up with k minus 1 regression models. And that's because um, if you, uh, because there's a sum to one constraint on these probabilities. Uh, by a simple analogy with our, our logistic model, we have two classes uh, of outcomes, but there's only one uh, regression model because the probability of falling in the other class is just one minus the probability of falling in the first class. Um, and the, the cumulative logit model uh, specifically, it's going to deal with the case of, of modeling the cumulative probability of being in any class, in that class, or the, any of the classes that came before it. Uh, and we're going to use that cumulative uh, nature of the problem uh, in order to address some of the challenges of specifying priors uh, and, and constraints on the, the multinomial model to ensure that we, in the end, always respect this sum to one constraint on probabilities. Uh, so if we look back at our, our basic regression, logistic regression model, we had assumed a binomial error distribution with some single theta. Uh, and we use a logit model to describe that single theta as a function of a, a set of linear predictors, some x betas. In the multinomial model, the multinomial distribution is very similar. It has uh, you know, n observations uh, and now falling into any one of k classes instead of just falling into one class. And then we have this product of probabilities uh, raised to the number of observations in that category. Uh, like with the binomial where we had that n set to 1, essentially giving us a Bernoulli with the multinomial regression, we're going to set that 1 that, that n to 1 because we're going to be modeling each observation individually. And if you look at these two probability distributions, you can see that the binomial really is just a special case of the multinomial because, again, uh, in the, the multinomial case, you have two cases, you know, a theta 1 and a theta 2, but that theta 2 is just 1 minus theta 1, such that you would have, you know, in the multinomial where you just have theta k to the yk, you'd have, you know, theta 1 to the y1 and then theta 2 uh, to the y2, but theta 2 is just 1 minus theta 1, and y2 is just n minus y1. Uh, in this idea of a cumulative logit model, what we're going to do is instead of writing down a, a logit model uh, for theta, for each of the thetas individually, we're going to write down a logit model for the cumulative sum of the thetas up from the first theta up to the kth class, little k here, uh, where we're, that little k goes from 1 up to the, the last case. Uh, once we have all those cumulative lo logit models for each of those cumulative cases, we need to 
then uh, relate them back to uh, this vector of uh, thetas for each of the individual probabilities. So for example, if we consider the first class, that's just our inverse uh, logit function that goes from uh, our linear model back to our uh, first class. Uh, for the second class and beyond, you have the probability, the cumulative probability of being in the little kth class uh, minus uh, the individual probabilities that came before that. So if I want to say, know the probability of the second class, I have the cumulative probability of being in the first two classes minus the probability of being in the first. And the probability of the third is the pro cumulative probability of being in the first three minus the probability of being in the first minus the probability of being in the second and so forth. And in the last class, because we have the sum to one constraint, it's just one minus all those other probabilities that came before. So then, you know, if we have, you know, K classes, we end up with K minus one uh, regression models. As I mentioned, you know, one of the reasons we use this cumulative logit model is that because it allows us to put these additional constraints on our choices of priors to force uh, our slopes and intercepts to be ordered, which helps us force these uh, cumulative probabilities to sum up to one. Um, so we want to make sure that we write down models that ensure that our cumulative probabilities do not result in curves that cross one another. So you, you couldn't have a probability of being in class one or and two being lower than probability of being in class one alone. And we do that essentially by enforcing that the slopes and intercepts must be ordered. So if the cumulative probability goes up, you know, the intercept of the uh, you know, the one and two class has to be bigger than the intercept of the one class. The slope of the one and two class must be bigger than the slope of the first class. And so for every class, the intercept uh, of that class has to be less than the intercept of the class above it. And the slope of the that class has to be less than the slope above it. And we can accumulate, we can accommodate these uh, range restrictions on the intercept and the slope uh, by using these indicator functions. So an indicator uh, is one if that statement is true and zero if that statement is false. So for example, in the multinomial regression, uh, we're going to specify priors on the intercept and priors on the, on the slope. And on the intercept, we have a, a, let's say we assume a normal prior on uh, that first intercept uh, for the first class times this indicator function that the slope, that the, the, the intercept of the first class is less than the intercept of the second class. And then for the intermediate classes, you have a, a normal prior on that intercept times this indicator that the intercept of that intermediate class is between the one that came before and the one that came after it. And then we have a, a restriction on the last class uh, that it be less, uh, that it be greater than the one that came before it. And then we have the same set of constraints uh, on the slopes as well. Um, so here, you know, this, this first variables in the subscript indicates whether you're intercept or a slope, and the sec second is indicating what class we're dealing with. If we want to implement the multinomial model in JAGS, uh, this code is a little bit more complicated than a lot of the models we've looked at, but it shows how we can do this. Um, so first, let's look at how we implement those uh, range restrictions on the prior. So here, um, I'm using uh, the second call, the second variable here and uh, to indicate whether I'm dealing with a, a intercept or a slope and the first indicate the class. And here I'm only going to deal with this simple case where we only have uh, three classes just to keep this code as understandable as possible. You know, it's basically the simplest multinomial model we could write down. Uh, again, because of the multinomial with two classes is just the standard logistic regression. 
so if I look at the, the first the intercepts, I have a normal prior on the first intercept with this T truncation function ensuring that there, there's no lower bound on that, but the upper bound is whatever the slope of the sec the intercept of the second class is. And then uh, in JAGS, I don't have to specify the paired constraint on, on that because I've already imposed it on the first class. And then I have similarly this, the slope of the first has to be less than the slope of the second. Uh, and then the last slope doesn't have a, a constraint. So I could, I could repeat this uh, for multiple classes. And if I had you know, more classes, I would end up with uh, intermediate case, cases that have both lower and upper constraints. Now diving into, so that's just the priors. Diving, oops. Diving into the, the process models themselves. Uh, the first process model is, is straightforward. It's a logit model for the first class. Just express as some um, X beta for the first set of the first intercept, uh, the first slope, uh, and, and our X. Now the second logit is now remember not the logit for the second class, but the logit for the cumulative probability in have, having been in either the first or second classes. Because that ref is reflected in our, our range restrictions on the, the intercepts and slopes. So now we've written down a cumulative probability of being in those classes. So, and then the third is just, you know, the cumulative probability to have been in the first, second, or third classes out of three classes is always 100%. So we don't need to write down a model for that. Uh, having written down the cumulative probability for the, the second, we need to now calculate the probabilities of having been in either the second or third classes. So the probability of being in the second or second mu is the cumulative probability of having, in, having been in the first or the second minus the probability of being in the first. And the probability of being in the third is just one minus the cumulative probability of everything that came before that. And you could see that if you had uh, even more cases, you would have additional cumulative probabilities uh, for you know third, fourth, fifth, whatever classes, and then additional calculations of those mu's, which would follow the standard problem pattern of the cumulative probability of being in that class, uh, essentially minus the cumulative probability of being in the class before it, with the last one just being one minus that cumulative. So this is now our process model specification, and then the, the data model is relatively straightforward. Uh, our Ys are observed uh, classifications are multinomial uh, with this vector of probabilities with a sample size of one. To look at this graphically, here I've imagining we have three possible outcomes and uh, just for convenience, I've put the middle case in the middle of the, of the graph. In reality, these would have might be coded A, B, or C, or you know one, two, or three, or something like that. Um, but since the pro probabilities are easily expressed between zero and one, I just put them all on the same graph, uh, just for visual purposes. If we look at what comes out of our cumulative models, this plot. Black line is the model for the first data set, the probability uh, of, of being in the first. The red line is the, then a cumulative probability of being in the first or, or the second. And this green line is the cumulative probability of been in, been in all three cases, which is one by definition. Uh, by subtracting those cumulative probabilities, we then end up with the individual probabilities of those classes. We can see that the, uh, over most of the space, the first class is the most likely. Um, though at the hot, low values of X, the third class is most likely, but it probably drops off steeply. And then the, the second class is similar to the first, but follows, be lags behind it uh, with a bit of, at, at a bit of a lag and is, is a bit more uh, nonlinear than the um, first. 
So to wrap up, over the last series of lectures, we've been looking at the assumptions of, of linear models, things like homoscedasticities, errors in variables, uh, how to deal with missing data, how to deal with non-normally distributed error. Uh, and as a, as a problem to, to you, the viewer, I, I leave an example to think about, which is, uh, could you combine those different things we've been learning about to actually write down models that might describe uh, data sets that we would likely encounter in the real world. So here's a simple question about, uh, our question might be, are banana slugs, these, these, uh, these yellow slimy guys here in the picture, are they susceptible to soil mercury contamination? So imagine I have Y is my data on slug counts. It is now count data uh, and it can't be negative. I might have 35 observations. XO might be my observations of soil mercury con concentration. Uh, but let's say I've, I've missed three out of those 35 samples, so I have a missing data problem. And let's also say that I have uh, uncertainty in those soil mer mercury concentrations as well. So maybe my, the specs on the instrument I'm using reports a 10% accuracy. And when I dig in further, that was uh, referred to a 95% confidence interval was calibrated with 150 points. Uh, this is you know, a relatively simple problem, but it already is invoking all the things we've learned. So we have non-Gaussian error, we have missing data, we have errors in our Xs in addition to errors in our Ys, uh, and we, we you know, may or may not have uh, an assumption of constant variance that we need to address. So it asks, you know, could you write down a graph that describes a model like this? What would, it, what would the JAGS code for models like this look like? Thanks.